Um, and so what I want to share with you tonight, and it's really just going to be a taste of some of the things that have been done, but I want to focus a bit on how massive advances in genomic technologies in the last 10 to 15 years have changed the way in which we're able to examine and learn about our past as modern humans. And I want to show you some of the things that we've learned about ourselves, but also some of the things that we've learned about um, extinct human relatives, such as the Neanderthals. And you're probably aware, we as humans, we're really curious about our own past. It seems to be something that everyone is interested in, and it's cool to work on something that everyone is interested in. And for hundreds of years, people have explored different ways to try and learn about our history. And of course, when there are written records, this is easy, but until quite recently, the primary way in which we'd learned about our deep past before there was written records was from archeological excavations, such as the one you see up here on the left. This is the excavation of a site in Spain called the Cima de los Huesos, which has been a very rich source of um, archaic common and bones. And the remains that are found at such, at such excavations, some of which you see illustrated here, including the fossil remains of, of humans, of animals, the tools, the art, um, and any other artifacts that have been left behind by the people who lived there have been really instrumental in allowing researchers to try and reconstruct the lives of the people who lived before there were written records. Um, and it's also from this fossil record that we know until around 40,000 years ago, there were many different kinds of human forms existing over quite extended period, periods of time in different places around the world. You see, there's a sort of really rich set of bits of fossils from, from different places. And it's quite extraordinary then that we as modern humans, um, you see us up here at the top, um, are now the only human form that remains, um, given that the sort of rich history of human forms before us. So the group that we belong to, modern humans, um, emerged quite recently, uh, somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years ago um, in Africa. And at that time, there were multiple other human groups still in existence. And you can see those in this um, little, wait, little purple block up here. Um, among those, Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals, um, perhaps the most well-known. Um, also Neanderthal relatives that I'll talk about a little bit later. And also um, more fragmentary evidence of other human groups. For example, the small humans on the island of Flores in Indonesia, uh, Homo floresiensis or the hobbits, were living at around the same time. So we've got at least three or four different human groups living at the period of around uh, between 200,000 years ago until around 40,000 years ago. Um, so the major expansion of modern humans out of Africa begins somewhere between 70 and 100,000 years ago, when modern humans begin moving out of Africa, arriving in the, in the Levant in the Middle East, and then spreading further into Eurasia around 50,000 years ago. And at that time, Neanderthals, at least, were still present in Eurasia. And so modern humans and Neanderthals were contemporaneous um, in Eurasia for some thousands of years before Neanderthals seemed to just disappear from the fossil record, perhaps approximately 40,000 years ago. And so for many years, the relationship between we as modern humans and Neanderthals was sort of this open question with lots of debate about whether, how we were related to one another, were they our ancestors, were they not? And the fossil record doesn't really have the power to resolve that question. It's only really in the last 20 years or so that we've been able to address this question of our relationship to the Neanderthals using genetic approaches, which are much more sensitive at being able to sort of pick this apart. And just so that we're all on the same page, you may know that there are two compartments in our cells that carry genetic material. Um, there's the nucleus, which you see here, and the nucleus carries the majority of our genome. In each cell, we have about a billion bases of DNA arranged in 22 chromosomes, um, 22 pairs of chromosomes, and we inherit one pair, one, one copy of the, each chromosome from our moms and one copy from our dads, and um, those are passed on per, across the generations, and they recombine with one another in each generation. There's also a small compartment, a set of small compartments called the mitochondria, and these small organelles also carry DNA. That DNA is essentially a single locus, it's one piece inherited as a, as a block, and it's only inherited maternally, so only from our mothers, or primarily from our mothers. Recent research is starting to suggest that maybe there's a little bit of inheritance from fathers too, but it's quite rare. And the mitochondrial genome is much smaller. It's just about 16,000 base pairs long. And 
there are many hundreds or even thousands of copies of this mitochondrial DNA present in nearly all the cells of our bodies. And so because the mitochondrial genome is so small and, and, and present in such large numbers, and because it could be amplified using molecular methods that were available in the late 1990s, the earliest ancient DNA studies that were carried out um, to assess the relationship of modern humans and Neanderthals targeted the mitochondrial DNA of the Neanderthals. And so in 1997, Santa Peber and Matthias Krings were able to sequence just a few hundred bases of the Neanderthal mitochondrial genome. But that was enough to show at least mitochondrially that Neanderthals, so you see a tree here, these are all Neanderthals, these are all modern humans, that Neanderthal mitochondrial genomes were outside the variation of present day modern human mitochondrial variation. In other words, that Neanderthals were our cousins, not our ancestors. And that was uh, a big finding at the time, this paper here published 1997, Neanderthals were, were not our ancestors. Um, finally resolving a point that had been quite debated. However, this question of whether there could have been any interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals wasn't resolved by the study of mitochondria. And that's because the mitochondrial genome, as I told you, is inherited only maternally and inherited in, in one block. So it only tells sort of the maternal line. The autosomal genome, the nuclear genome, which is inherited from both parents, provides a, a sort of a mosaic picture of, of the DNA inherited from all our ancestors. And that allows us to even see if there are small amounts of ancestry um, in the past from, from other groups. And so it was necessary in order to fully resolve this question of whether Neanderthals and, and modern human ancestors had, had interbred to have nuclear DNA sequences from Neanderthals. However, in, 19, in the late 1990s, when that work was done, large scale nuclear genome sequencing of ancient specimens was simply completely infeasible. And this, was due, this is due to a number of features, both of the DNA itself, the DNA that you get from fossils, but also of the technologies that were available at the time. And so just a quick overview of those features. When we get DNA, when we extract DNA from bones or from teeth, that DNA has been lying in the ground for many thousands of years. Our typical Neanderthal specimens are between 40 and 150,000 years old. Um, and what happens when DNA lies around like that is that it degrades. So it gets broken into smaller bits. And what you can see here is an example of sort of a fragment length distribution of the typical, um, in a typical uh, DNA specimen from a Neanderthal, where you can see that most of the molecules are rather short. They're in the range of 40, 50, 60 nucleotides long. That means we have to reassemble uh, 3 billion base pair genome in bits, in tiny little puzzle pieces that are just a few tens of bases long. The DNA also gets chemically modified over time. So the chemical um, backbone of the DNA or the, the cytosine molecules in the DNA deaminate um, in the presence of water. And they deaminate um, into a molecule called uracil which mean that it means that we have this very characteristic feature of ancient DNA, which is the presence of these uracils. But it also means that every molecule we get has many errors in it. And that poses a lot of challenges for the analysis, for the alignment of the sequences, but also for understanding, you know, when do we really have an error and when do we really have a correct sequence? And you'll see later how we, how we overcome that. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, the vast majority of the, C the DNA that we get from most bone and tooth specimens doesn't come from the individual that the bone or the tooth belonged to. Instead, most of that DNA comes from microbes. These microbes colonize the, body, the, the bones after the death of the individual and um, end up making up the majority of the DNA that we get from most specimens. So this is an example of the very first Neanderthal genome where um, about 3% of the DNA could be identified as hominin, and the rest was largely microbial. We therefore need, um, this, this causes two problems. It makes sequencing really costly, because for every three um, Neanderthal molecules we get, we have to sequence 97 microbial molecules. Uh, it makes sequencing really expensive. And we also need methods that reliably distinguish proper Neanderthal sequences from this microbial sequence. And so, Although DNA, and then I also they would said also that there were technolo technological limitations. So although DNA sequencing was invented, the technology was invented in the 1970s, the sequencing instruments that were available until the mid 2000s were these ABI sequences that you see here. And those sequences were only, are, are they're still around, are only able to sequence at most 384 fragments of DNA at a time. 
and 384 fragments with great effort and at very high cost. And so one of the aims of the Human Genome Project back in the day was to give, um, to, to motivate the development of technologies or better sequencing technologies, better cheaper sequencing technologies to allow large scale sequencing of, of genomes of all organisms. And, and the Human Genome Project really achieved, if it achieved one thing besides the genome itself, it achieved that it really gave a huge boost to uh, sequencing technologies. And so starting with in 2005, we began to see the succession of new sequencing technologies and new instruments that now make it possible to cost effectively sequence massive numbers of DNA fragments simultaneously and quite fast. So the latest technologies that we have, which are this, which is this NovaSeq Nova 6000, which is sort of the highest throughput instrument available on the market at the moment, can sequence 20 billion DNA fragments in a single run at a fraction of the cost of um, what an, a fragment would have cost from on an ABI sequencer. And so it was only with these new sequencing technologies at hand that it finally became feasible to sequence ancient nuclear genomes or ancient nuclear DNA in the quantities that were needed to reconstruct the nuclear, de the nuclear genomes of ancient humans. And so in 2005, we began to think about how one would do that. Um, and I have to say that at first it wasn't obvious that it would work very easily. Um, and so there was a lot of effort put into the development of methods to improve the, how we obtain DNA from, in this case, Neanderthal bones. And so how this process typically works is that we, first of all, we work with archaeologists and with museum curators who provide us access to specimens. And you can see here on the left, this is um, one of our researchers at an excavation when there are new excavations um, there is great efforts taken to um, remove the bones that we want to sample or the sediment that we want to sample, whatever we want, under sterile conditions so as not to contaminate it with modern human DNA. What then happens is that a small amount of powder is drilled from the bone or the tooth. We do our very best to minimize the amount of damage caused to material. There's often work done before we work on any human bones, there's often work done on animal bones to see whether there's any hope of obtaining DNA from bones at the site before we start to damage um, potentially valuable material. So we, we um, extract a little bit of powder, usually on the order of 10 to 50 milligrams of powder, which we drill from the specimen. Um, DNA is then extracted using um, custom protocols that allow us to ensure that we retrieve um, these short, very short molecules, most DNA extraction protocols are not optimized for very short molecules. So we have optimization for very short molecules. And um, then we move into the step of library preparation, which you see here. You can also see this is all done under clean room conditions with uh, researchers wearing masks, gloves, and um, other protective gear in order to prevent again contamination with modern DNA. What we then do is for each of the molecules that we've managed to extract from the bone, you see those in black, we add to that um, adapter sequences, which are known DNA sequences that we can use then to uh, initiate the sequencing process. And each of those uh, DNA molecules also gets um, a, a barcode like index sequence, which allows us to identify molecules that legitimately come from the specimen from which they were, pre which they were uh, prepared. And you see in the top right here, my colleague Matthias Meyer, and, and all credit to him and his group, they've customized techniques at every step along this way to ensure that we sample specimens as non-destructively non as possible, and that we can both efficiently and selectively retrieve ancient DNA from these ancient specimens. My group then sort of takes over at the, at the computational step. So we move into sequencing um, DNA using, uh, at this point, we're using the uh, Lumina sequencing technology. And we then identify potentially archaic human reads and separate them from my microbial reads by aligning the short fragments we get to the reference human genome, because we're so similar, Neanderthals, we, we, Neanderthals are so similar to we modern humans that that's a, a plausible way to do this. Using these methods, it's been possible over the course of the last decade or so to sequence high quality nuclear genomes of three Neanderthals. We have one Neanderthal from Vindia Cave in Croatia. This was the first Neanderthal to be sequenced. Um, it's a young Neanderthal in that it's one of the later Neanderthals that lived approximately 45,000 years ago. Um, 
And then we have two more Neanderthals from, from the Altai Mountains, one from Denisova Cave, which you'll hear more about soon, and one from a cave quite near to Denisova called Chigirskaya. It's just in the next valley over. And these sequences, these genomes, um, are sequenced to between 30 and 50 fold coverage. And so for the non-repetitive regions of the genome that we can reassemble with short reads, they're of a quality that's quite similar to that of modern genomes. Um, and they therefore form a very important reference panel for us and for others um, studying humans. And just so that you can see what this looks like, what you see here is a small screenshot of a little piece of chromosome 22, where you can see each of these little blocks of color is in a line DNA fragment. You can see that we stack them all up. So at every position, we see the base multiple times. That gives us additional confidence that we're calling the correct base. Um, and you can see here that these are all Neanderthal reads down here, the human reference sequences here below. And if I can point out one thing, it's that there's one difference. There's one position in this piece of sc the screen that you can see where the Neanderthal that we're looking at carries a C at this position and all modern humans carry a G. So we have one um, place where we can say quite confidently that the Neanderthal genome differs from the modern human genome. And we go like this through all um, at, you know, all sort of 67 and 70% of the genome that we can actually cover, identifying places where um, modern humans and Neanderthals differ. In addition to this, and because most specimens don't yield enough DNA for us to get nice high coverage genomes where we see every base 30, 40, 50 times, we sequenced um, an additional 10 or so Neanderthals um, to lower coverage, so where we see each position between two and five times. Um, and the important thing about these Neanderthals, and you can see them here in gray and in white, is that they represent some of the, the geographic range of the Neanderthals. So we before sampled just this Neanderthal from Vindia and, and then some here from the very east of the Neanderthal range. Now we sample from the west of the Neanderthal range too, also some from sort of more centrally, and also sample better with, with these genomes, the time, um, the temporal range of the Neanderthals. So we see older Neanderthals and younger ones. And this is interesting to understand what did Neanderthal populations look like over time. And so these genomes have provided us with um, a number of insights into the Neanderthal populations. For example, we've seen that Neanderthals, all the Neanderthals that we've looked at so far have very low genetic diversity. If we count the number of differences um, and the number of DNA bases that differ between the two chromosomes in a single individual, the one that comes from the mother and the one from the father, in, in this case, the Altai Neanderthal. We see over here, this is a bunch of modern humans, present day people. Over here, you see the highest um, variation, the highest heterozygosity is in African individuals, um, where we see something on the order of 10 per 10, 000, 10 differences between the two copies of the genome per 10,000 bases. And here we see, um, uh, Eurasian individuals where we see from six to eight differences. And you can see the Neanderthals very low. We see um, about two, 1.8 to two differences per 10,000 bases, um, making variation, genetic variation in Neanderthals significantly lower than in modern humans and among the lowest for any organism reported to date. This is consistent with the idea that, that Neanderthals lived in rather small isolated groups, that there was quite a lot of um, inbreeding in these groups. And we think, we estimated most recently that these groups would have been on the order of 60 to 100 individuals per group. In addition, the sequencing of ancient DNA um, from these sites led to the discovery of um, a previously unknown group of archaic hominins. Um, during our sequencing of the Neanderthals, we were given this very tiny finger bone that you see over here. Um, it was found in Denisova Cave. Um, which is in the Altai Mountains, as I said. And from this tiny finger bone, we were able to extract enough DNA to reconstruct a high coverage nuclear genome that showed the, that the bone was from an individual that belonged to a group that hadn't been seen before. It was not a Neanderthal. Um, it shares a common ancestor. It's a cousin of the Neanderthals. It shares a common ancestor with Neanderthals um, somewhere in the order of 350 to 500,000 years ago. And they together then share a common ancestor with modern humans 600 to 700,000 years ago. So this is a group that had not been reported before in the literature. Uh, they are now called the Denisovans after the cave where they were found. And the fossil remains of Denisovans are still quite limited. Um, so far they're identified by DNA only from a handful of specimens, all from Denisova cave. These are the specimens, they're actually the rest of them largely teeth. Um, and there are certainly a number of individuals here. I think we at the last count have at least five or maybe six individuals. 
Excitingly, there was a mandible found last year in China on the Tibetan plateau, which might be the first evidence of Denisovans outside of Denisova cave. Not only is the morphology of the or the morphology of the teeth in this mandible um, rather similar to the morphology of the teeth we see at Denisova cave, um, but although we couldn't get any, there, there was no DNA able to be extracted from this bone. It was possible for a group with Frida, under Frida Welke to extract a small number of bone peptide fragments. And those peptide fragments were sequenced by mass spec. And one of these peptides carried an amino acid change, so a change in the protein sequence that we know by comparison to the genomes is specific to Denisovans. So we think that this is evidence that this, this is likely Denisovans. Um, subsequently, work on DNA in the sediments found at the site where this bone comes from has shown that there is Denisovan DNA also in the soil in the cave where this was found, suggesting that Denisovans lived at high altitudes in Tibet. And in fact, this bone is dated to 160,000 years old, and the, um, the sediments also suggest that Denisovans were long-term occupants on the Tibetan plateau. So it's going to be very interesting in time to see what more we learn about Denisovans. So one of the things we can do when we have these genomes in hand is to identify genetic changes that have taken place on the lineage to modern humans. So changes that, that may make modern humans different from our nearest ancestors and which might underlie some unique and, and interesting human phenotypes. In the past, this has been done by comparing our genomes to those of our living relatives. The, the nearest living relatives we have are the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. But our common ancestor with the chimpanzee, and gorilla, and orangutan lived between five and seven million years ago. And so there are a lot of changes on this lineage, about 18 million human specific changes since our split from the common ancestor with the chimpanzee. With the Neanderthal and Denisovan in hand, um, and with a much more recent common ancestor shared with Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, between six, around 600,000 years ago, we can divide this lineage much more closely and identify changes that really happened in the last five, 600,000 years on the modern human lineage. And we find that there are approximately 30,000 such sites where all people living today differ from the Neanderthals and the Denisovans that we have already. And about 100 of those change the protein coding sequences. So they change what we think of as important um, structural features of the proteins that are made by our genes. And the, there's ongoing work on um, these changes, looking at the effects of these changes in cell models, in organoids, and also in animal models such as mice. We've also made a catalog of these. Um, we have this sort of essentially complete catalog of all the recent changes in humans, modern humans, that are accessible with these short read technologies. This was compiled by two previous group mem members in my group, Martin Kirchia and, and Fernando Rassimo. And it's now been extended by Christian Haider, who you see here. And Christian's also put a part of this resource, all the differences in and near coding sequences into a browser, which is based on the exact browser this gives us um, information about uh, the, the frequency of each of the variants that we see. Um, we can see what variant each of the archaic genomes carries. We can see the frequency in, in modern humans, and we can see the effect of that. So it's possible for people to now use this um, in order to explore differences between archaic and modern humans in coding sequences. Um, there's a beta version of that browser available. The URL is there at the top. Um, it's not completely brand free yet, it's not completely complete yet, um, but I think it's already something that's quite useful. Another thing that uh, having these genomes allowed us to do was to revisit this question of whether they'd been interbreeding between our ancestors and the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. And using quite simple tests, it was possible to show that all present day humans of non-African ancestry have inherited about 2% of their genomes from Neanderthals and that there's as much as 4% Denisovan DNA, but restricted to the, the indigenous peoples of Papua and Australia. And there's also a small amount of Denisovan DNA in other Asian populations, particularly in South Asia. This is a very hot area of research. How, when, where, how many times did modern humans encounter and interbreed with Neanderthals and Denisovans? And there's quite a lot of controversy in this region, in this area too. Um, so it's certainly more to be discovered there. But we have a rather simple model that's consistent with the data that we have currently. And that's that we think that when modern humans uh, begin to move out of Africa somewhere, as I said, between 70 and 100,000 years ago, they met and mixed with Neanderthals quite early on. Um, 
um, probably around 70,000 years ago, perhaps somewhere in the Levant. As the population then expanded out into Europe and Asia, so this modern human population continues to grow and expand, um, we see that they carry this Neanderthal DNA with them um, throughout Eurasia and out into the Pacific, into the uh, into Oceania. Sorry. Um, and so the major part of the Neanderthal ancestry that we see in non-African people of non-African ancestry today comes from this, we think comes from this very first um, encounter with Neanderthals. We also have direct evidence of local instances of gene flow with Neanderthals um, in uh, various parts of Europe at later times, but that contributes less to people living today. In addition, in mainland, uh, mainland Asians carry a small fraction of Denisovan ancestry, about 2%. And Melanesian groups, particularly Papuan and, uh, Papuans and Aboriginal Australians, carry as much as 4% Denisovan DNA. And there's quite good evidence now that this comes from at least two rounds of admixture with quite genetically distinct Denisovan populations. So we think the Denisovan range was sort of um, in the east, perhaps down into island Southeast Asia. And uh, it suggests that the Denisovans, of them, Denisovan, Denisovans themselves may have been quite variable. Um, I think what I like about this is that the Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in modern genomes and people living today sort of acts like a bit like a dye. It allows us to, to trace how early humans moved and, and who they interacted with as they moved. Um, and it's become quite clear that modern humans were moving a lot and that they were interbreeding a lot with the local hominins that they found as they moved. So I think that the, the emerging picture is lots of interbreeding. So here's a really simple visualization of the distribution of Neanderthal alleles in the, genome of, in the genomes of a set of humans. So each line here is a, a different present day human. This is a piece of chromosome 13. And what you see as little yellow or blue um, flashes of color are places where that individual carries uh, either one or two copies of uh, Neanderthal chromosomes. And what you can see, I think, quite clearly is that each individual has a unique set, unique pieces of Neanderthal DNA, that there is some overlap, sometimes individuals share a piece, but often um, bits of the Neanderthal genome are repre represented in one or few individuals and not in others. So each person carries sort of their own composed 2% of the genome. You can... Uh, the other thing that's interesting for me is that if you add this all together, we can reconstruct about 40% of the genome of the, the introgressing Neanderthals. If we just sort of add across all the bits of Neanderthal DNA we see in different people. You also see that the Neanderthal DNA in these individuals is not very evenly distributed. There seem to be regions that are brighter and regions that are darker, suggesting perhaps that Neanderthal DNA um, in modern humans hasn't um, escaped selection, hasn't been completely neutral. And an analysis from Sri Ram Shankar Raman, who was a postdoc in, in David Reich's group some years ago, showed that the genomic regions where Neanderthal DNA is less common, so here we see genomic regions where the amount of Neanderthal DNA is lower, those regions um, are typically are, are under more evolutionary constraint. That means they're typically thought of as more functionally important. So very simply said, there is less Neanderthal DNA in regions of the genome that we think are functionally important. And that has been used to propose that a major force has been the action of purifying selection to remove Neanderthal alleles in and around genes and other functional elements in modern humans, implying that a substantial fraction of the alleles, the Neanderthal alleles that entered the modern human uh, modern humans uh, by integration were deleterious for modern humans. And um, Martin Petter in my group, uh, who you see here, has looked a little more closely at that. And he shows that particularly regions around genes, specifically regions that are involved in regulating the expression of genes, such as the promoter regions um, and the very conserved protein coding regions, show a, a greater depletion of Neanderthal DNA, suggesting that selection against Neanderthal DNA, or where Neanderthal DNA was most deleterious, was in the regions that control how genes are expressed, suggesting that Neanderthals might have differed quite a lot from modern humans in their gene regulation, and perhaps not quite so much in their protein coding sequences. So I told you that there's been a lot of selection against Neanderthal DNA. Um, but if we look in the genomes of Europeans and East Asians, and we're looking at a little piece of chromosome nine here, you can see that um, 
in some regions, Neanderthal ancestry is actually quite high. So this is the mean Neanderthal ancestry on the y-axis. And what you can see is that in Europeans, 60% of individuals carry Neanderthal DNA at this little place on chromosome 9. And here you can see sort of almost 60% of East Asians carry Neanderthal DNA here. And you can see some of these peaks are shared. So both in both populations, we see quite a lot of individuals carrying Neanderthal DNA. And sometimes it's unique to one or other populations. And so we think that some um, introgressed Neanderthal sequences have been positive for the carriers, so have been positively selected. And Misha Dunneman in my group, who was a postdoc, was interested in identifying introgressed DNA that might have been advantageous for modern humans. And he looked in the genomes of around 1,500 people living today in different populations worldwide and identified a rather long stretch. You see it sort of here in the stretch in, in European genomes and in Asian genomes, sort of shown in two different ways. Um, a long stretch of DNA on chromosome 4. It's about 140,000 bases long. And that whole stretch matches the Neanderthal genome very closely. And for us, this region was interesting because it encompasses three genes, which you see here. And those three genes are members of uh, the toll-like receptor gene family. And the toll-like receptors are proteins of the innate immune system. This is the part of our immune system that's the first part to respond to, to new pathogens, um, the sort of automated response. And these three toll-like receptor, uh, receptor genes, or the proteins that they encode, are cell surface receptors. So they act a bit like a surveillance system for the cell. They sit on the sur surface of the cell, and when they recognize microbial surface proteins, lipopolysaccharides, they then elicit an inflammatory response and an antimicrobial response and activate the adaptive immune system, which allows us to learn about we've seen this, this pathogen before. And so as such, these toll receptors are really important as a first line of defense against pathogens. And when we look at the, the worldwide distribution of introgressed haplotypes at the toll receptor, and you see in orange and in green, two we actually see two evidence for two different Neanderthal haplotypes. You see that um, these um, introgressed haplotypes are present um, across the, all of uh, the out-of-African populations, um, sometimes at quite high frequency, specifically um, in, in the East and also in, in Southern Europe, as high as 50 to 60 percent in some populations. Um, and you also see it difference. So we have these two sort of evidence for what I would say is two introgressions from Neanderthals. One is the orange haplotype, which is present in everyone. And the other is the green, which is restricted to, to Asia. And this is consistent with um, some co recent studies that have suggested that there was a sort of unique pulse of Neanderthal integration into the ancestors of present day Asian populations. We showed that the, um, the carriers of Neanderthal introgressed alleles express the um, express the, these three genes, these three toll -like receptor genes more highly. Um, there's no difference in the protein coding sequences caused by the Neanderthal genes, but instead um, carrying, in this case, um, two copies of the Neanderthal um, toll -like receptor leads to the highest expression, just one copy. So a heterozygote has intermediate expression and not um, a Neanderthal like allele leads to the lowest expression. And we also see that this is really specific um, to cells and tissues involved in the immune system. So we asked, could it have a particular effect on phenotype? And in order to do that, um, we looked at a public database of genome-wide association studies. These are studies that link genetic variants to phenotypes in very large cohorts, um, lots of people. And what we found was that there are significant associations to um, different phenotypes in this region. And this is the region here on chromosome 4. Um, and we found that the variants that we're particularly interested in, the introgressed variants, are specifically associated with two studies. The first is a study of common allergies, where many thousands of people were asked about their allergies to pollen and to pet fur and to dust. And here we see that this region, the toll-like receptor region, is um, the best candidate for explaining the genetic basis of this response. And the second is a study of infection with Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacterium that infects the stomach and is associated with gastric ulcers. And in both studies, the introgressed Neanderthal alleles were the, were the most strongly associated with the trait. And it goes in the direction that the Neanderthal-like alleles are consistently associated with decreased infection with Helicobacter pylori and with increased susceptibility to common allergies. 
This led us to propose, and this is just speculation, that the increased expression of the toll-like receptor genes that we saw leads to an increased expression of proteins on the cell surface, and that having more of these toll-like receptor proteins on the surface may enhance innate immune surveillance. This would in improve or increase the reactivity against pathogens, such as Helicobacter pylori, but we don't think it's necessarily driven by Helicobacter pylori. However, it may also lead to an oversensitivity to non-pathogenic allergens and cause, thereby cause allergies um, in present-day people. And that's something that I think would be interesting to be able to test um, more thoroughly. At the moment, it's just a speculation. A second um, uh, effect of Neanderthal alleles, it goes in the other direction, um, a contrast, is one that my colleague Hugo Seberg, who you see there in the top right, um, has identified. And he's identified Neanderthal DNA that has negative consequences for its carriers. And so Hugo's a, a member of a large consortium that's carrying out genome-wide association studies to try and determine whether, in addition to lifestyle factors, there might also be a genetic component to why some people become so very ill with SARS-CoV-2, with COVID, and others don't. And so this is, of course, very topical, very hot topic at the moment. Um, and a study published early last year looking at the genomes of people who become severely ill, so are hospitalized and become severely ill with COVID, and comparing those genomes to the genomes of the general population, identify just a single um, strong significant association, just one region on chromosome 3, a gene cluster on chromosome 3. And that's the uh, now considered uh, the strongest risk locus um, for respiratory failure after uh, infection with severe um, with SARS, with severe SARS-CoV-2. And surprisingly, when Hugo looked more closely at this risk haplotype, he found that the stretch of DNA that's associated with becoming severely ill matches the Neanderthal genome. So he basically looked at the reference, he looked at the risk haplotype, and then he looked at the Neanderthals we have, and showed that almost every variant on this risk haplotype is actually on the Neanderthal genome too. Um, that's over a span of around 50,000 bases, and uh, very much consistent with the idea that this stretch of DNA was actually inherited from Neanderthals by introgression around 70,000 years ago. And the effect of this introgressed DNA is quite substantial. Ind individuals who carry one copy of the Neanderthal genome in this region of chromosome 3 um, are about twice as likely to develop severe COVID. And individuals that ha who have both chromosomes, uh, there are two copies of the Neanderthal sequence, so they get it from both their parents, are four to five times more likely to become critically ill. When uh, Hugo looked at the worldwide prevalence of this risk haplotype, he saw that it's um, at about 16 to 18% frequency in Europe. It's at quite high frequency in South Asia. Um, as many as 50 as many as 50 percent can uh, people carry at least one of the uh, risk haplotypes in some populations. And you see it's completely absent in East Asia, which is quite an interesting observation and may suggest that previous pandemics have um, eliminated this haplotype in East Asian populations. So there's a growing list of Neanderthal alleles. I wish I could tell you more about some more of them, but there's a growing list of Neanderthal alleles that affect or influence modern human phenotypes. Um, interestingly, the introgressed sequences that seem to have been advantageous for modern humans seem to largely, and those are what you see in the, the figure there, what we call adaptive, um, they seem to largely influence genes that are linked to immunity, to metabolism, and to response to environmental conditions like temperature and sunlight and altitude. And I think I like to think about it that, you know, we get from Neanderthals and Denisovans all the variation that they had in their genomes. And, and given that they lived in, in Eurasia for well over 300,000 years, they were presumably quite well adapted to the local environments in which they lived. So that's the foods and the climate and especially the pathogens. And it's perhaps not so surprising then that some of the alleles, some of the, the, the DNA we get from them is advantageous to us when we try, when we as modern humans arrive in Eurasia and start to adapt to the new regime of pathogens and climate. Um, this is a sort of a, what I'd like to think is an evolutionary shortcut to acquiring adaptations. Normally you would get a new mutation and that new mutation would have to rise in frequency and it takes quite some time. Um, and in this way, by interbreeding with the locals, you sort of have this pulse of, of potentially advantageous alleles that, or 
even if they're not advantageous immediately, this pulse of variation that's introduced into the genomes of modern humans that can then be acted on by selection going forward. So they can be removed if they're deleterious, but if they provide any kind of advantage, they can be acted on and they can increase in frequency in the population, improving the adaptation of that population. Um, there's some interesting recent work that has stressed that these integral variants need not have been adaptive right immediately. Some of them could have hung around, right? We introduced this variation, sort of this palette of variation into modern humans. And that hangs around and can be acted on by selection at any point, as long as it's around, can be acted on selection at any point thereafter. So some of these, um, the onset of selection on some of these alleles might have occurred many generations after the, they were introduced by interbreeding. And so I need to draw it to a close there, I think. Um, I hope I've been able to convince you that sequencing ancient genomes is more than just kind of curiosity and fun. It's, these genomes are a quite rich resource to learn about human history and to learn about the origins of both advantageous and disadvantageous genetic variation in our genomes. We've used these genomes to identify uniquely modern um, genetic variants, and that's really work in progress on understanding what is the functional relevance of them. Can we understand what sets modern humans apart from, from other humans? We've looked at the patterns of Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry that have told us something about how modern humans moved um, through, through the world and how they interacted with archaic humans, so where these archaic humans were, and it's also enabled able us to find um, new archaic human groups that weren't known about before. And then looking at this integrased DNA, that's um, these bits of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA that we now have left in our genomes sort of 50 to 70,000 years later, allows us to look back and say, well, what were the important selective pressures in our past? So what traits and selective pressures have been important in our recent human history? And we see very clearly that immunity is, of course, a very important one. Uh, we see many loci that are associated with immunity, but also with um, adaptation to environment in general. And then finally, I want to end by thanking all the people who've worked on these projects that I've presented. The work is all done in the Department of Evolutionary Genetics uh, under Sanjay Peber, who's the head of the department, um, in close collaboration with the group of Matthias Meyer and, and Ben Peter, and with the whole ancient DNA group um, at the Institute. And then, of course, and very importantly, all our collaborators who share interesting specimens and who challenge us with important questions in human evolution. And then finally, thank you to you for your attention. Janet, excellent. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so if there are any questions from the floor, if you can enter them into the into the sort of a chat box and then we'll put them to Janet. Um, whilst we're waiting for questions to appear, I, I can perhaps kick off by, by, by asking a couple of questions. Um, is it at all possible, um, and is there sufficient data um, to look at environmental changes over time? So, for instance, the deposition of pollen and different types of pollen um, in different soil layers, and relate that to environmental differences that that could have occurred at the same time when you had human migrations. Is there any sort of correlation between such yeah. any sort of climate changes? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I, I don't think I have a spare slide on this, but there are these um, what they call MIS events, which are sort of warming and cooling events over the last few hundred thousand years. Mm -hmm. And it does look like, so there are um, people working in, in archaeology who correlate from the fossil record human movements with these warming and cooling periods. And there is a correlation going to a finer level of detail and actually looking at sort of what in, in the layers of an, of an archaeological um, site, mm -hmm. what species are present, both plant and animal, and what humans are present, which humans are present, and when are they present, um, mm -hmm. is something that people have started doing. But I think in terms of genetic evidence, it's still quite early days. Um, I think it is a very definite and very interesting um, avenue of research. Right. The the um, I'm still waiting for questions to pop up. Um, Wida, perhaps you can alert me if anything comes up. Um, the, the second question I have, Janet, is if you look at the susceptibility um, um, to SARS-CoV-2, 
um, and you look at the, distrib the, the, the distribution, um, can one perhaps relate the very high incidence of, of COVID-19 in India to the, the sort of genetic makeup of that population? And um, would one tend then to think that there will be a much lower level of the disease um, in Oceania? It's a good question. I think that it's it's much more complex, of course. Um, while this chromosome 3 locus is the major genetic risk locus, we know that there are many other non-genetic factors that are that are incredibly um, more powerful risk factors, age, um, comorbidities. And so untangling the effect of genetics from the effect of age and, and, and other comorbidities is, of course, not trivial. So I wouldn't like to make a statement like it's obvious that okay. this is the reason for the high incidence in, in India. But no. of course, it would contribute if the, the um, incidence of, of this um, haplotype is high there, which it does seem to be. This is certainly a contributing factor. Okay, okay. Um, the other question that I'd like to get back to is you, you showed the um, the study that was published in Cell in terms of the mitochondrial inheritance. And um, the what strikes me is, so if you look at, at, at a modern human, there's, there's basically no evidence of inheritance of Neanderthal mitochondria at all. Um, so does this um, illuminate the type of interactions that possibly took place in 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 interbreeding of, uh, shall we call it pro-modern human and Neanderthal um, groupings in in Europe. So people have suggested that. I think the evidence is not so clear. There are stochastic processes that could lead to this pattern too. So we don't have to assume that it was. Um, that modern that Neanderthal females were not contributing. Mm. Um, in fact, I, I left out a large part of the story. We've we've recently worked on the mitochondria and Y looking at the mitochondria and the Y chromosomes of Neanderthals, um, and we see something very interesting. We see that this is a long and complicated story. Let me try and state it really simply. <laughs> we see that um, we we interested to hear to, to hear it. Maybe, so we see that um, the divergence time, we, we, there's always been this weird in, um, inconsistency that on the mitochondrial genomes, Neanderthals and modern humans are more closely related to each other than Neanderthals are to Denisovans. That is contrary to the pattern that we see in the nuclear genome, where Neanderthals and Denisovans are sister groups with, with modern humans outside. And, and there was a proposal put forward that this that initially it was thought that the Denisovans were the unusual ones, that maybe the Denisovans carried a strange mitochondria that came in from some other super archaic group. So you had this really deeply diverged mitochondrial genome in Denisovans. Mm -hmm. Turns out that doesn't seem to be the case. It's actually the Neanderthals that carry um, a strange mitochondria. And we can see that because the divergence time of Neanderthal and modern human mitochondria is um, much shallower than the divergence time of their nuclear genomes. In other words, Neanderthals appear to have inherited mitochondria from a proto-modern human population, probably on the order of, and now I'm guessing, between 200 and 400,000 years ago, based on our estimates. Yeah. And that was put forward um, because we see very old Neanderthals that are dated to around 200,000 years ago that don't carry um, the strange mitochondria. They carry a Denisovan-like mitochondria. Wow. It's a very complicated story. But the same is true in the Y chromosome. So what we see is, is some apparent contact, again, sort of evidence of an earlier contact that we weren't aware of between a group of, I'm calling them modern humans, but proto-modern humans, so 200 to 300,000 year old modern humans mm -hmm. that were in contact with Neanderthals and that contributed to them the their mitochondria and their Y chromosome such that all Neanderthals subsequent to that time carry what is essentially a modern human uh, mitochondria and Y chromosome. Mm -hmm. um, we desperately need to prove that we're correct about this because this is a, an assumption made on the pattern that we see and it, it's an unusual pattern. We desperately need very old Neanderthals. So Neanderthals mm -hmm. that are older than the sort of 200,000 years. Right. Those are rare to find in the fossil right. record. And when we have found them, you typically don't get very much DNA from them if any. Sure. So that's definitely sort of a big focus of ours at the moment, trying to see how old can we go? Can we go back right. far enough that we can actually find Neanderthal? Our direct prediction will be 
that that early Neanderthals carry um, a different um, a, 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 y, a Y chromosome that looks like the Y chromosome of Denisovans. Okay, fascinating. Thanks. I see that. Um, let's uh, go to the questions in the chat. Um, the one question is from from Vera Fariba Son, um, who thanks you for the amazing talk. And she says, you said that the development of new analytical instruments have enabled this research. What more can we expect from future research in this field? What more would you like to know if you could? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so sequencing technologies have made these huge leaps and bounds in the last years. Um, and we were very happy. So initially, what was possible was to sequence um, short pieces of DNA. This Illumina technology is very well suited for short bits of DNA. The direction that the field seems to be taking now is to try and sequence longer and longer DNA molecules, right? To try and reassemble whole, the paper in the last weeks, reassemble a whole chromosome in one sequencing read. For us, that's pretty useless, right? I mean, we don't have long molecules. So, so for us, that direction doesn't help very much. Um, I think technologies that will help us are more in the order of, um, can we improve proteomic technologies such that we can get more peptide fragments? Because there is some suggestion that peptides, some peptides might preserve better than DNA. And that would allow us to look, this is already being done in some groups, but they're still restricted at the number of peptides they can look at. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a, an obvious synergy between in proteomic technologies for, for ancient DNA. And then another, another area that's being quite heavily explored in our department is um, removing the need to get DNA from bones and teeth at all, you know, destructive sampling. So can uh, Matthias Meyer and others have shown that DNA can be extracted from sediment samples and also even quite old, so that the DNA somehow um, leaches from the bones into the, the soil. Right. And then if you take some soil, you can actually extract DNA from that soil. Mm -hmm. You don't get high quality genomes, of course, but you can, of course, trace, as you were asking, you can trace the presence of different groups over time mm -hmm. using that kind of that kind of evidence. And, and that opens up huge um, prospects, right? Because at all sites, you have sand. At most sites, you don't have bones and teeth. Right, right. Okay, good. Let's go to the next question. Um, this is um, um, from from Hayton Francis. Um, um, how much of effect did the differences in immune systems have on the viability of the offspring of interbreeding during gestation? <laughs> I think the answer is we don't really know. We don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Um, there's been some speculation that there was some level of hybrid incompatibility, um, that um, the hybrid offspring were either less fertile, or clearly there, there were some that were fertile because otherwise we wouldn't carry Neanderthal DNA or Denisovan DNA today. But that um, the de apparent depletion of Neanderthal DNA on the X chromosome might point at some level of reduced fertility, whether that's biologically reduced and whether it's due to immune genes, we don't know. Or whether it might be some kind of sexual selection, some kind of favoring of, of mates um, is still very much open. OK, a related question from Adrian Laterhan. Um, given that Denisovans and Neanderthals had more time to adapt to the environments before the arrival of modern humans, is it surprising, surprising that so much of the integrated DNA underwent purifying selection? Do we have any theories why human DNA was selected instead? Yeah, we do actually. That's a that's a great opening for a, a piece of information I couldn't include. So it comes back to this point that I made early on that we think that the variation, the Neanderthal populations were quite small. Um, and in small populations, it's difficult to remove mildly deleterious variants on the genomes of individuals in that population. So what what we have what we and others have shown happens using simulation is that if you have a very small population and mildly mildly deleterious variants can then accumulate, um, assuming that happens, which is a normal process, when those when so now we have an Neanderthal population where there's a lot of mildly deleterious variation hanging around mm -hmm. because it can't be selected out. When that's introduced into a modern human population, which is larger, those mildly deleterious variants become visible to um, to purifying selection, 
and get removed. And that's what we primarily think is going on. Okay. That it's sort of more, it's more a, a normal population genetic process than that, that it's anything special about the human alleles. In some regions, it will be something special about human alleles, but on average, we think it reflects simply integration into a larger population where purifying selection operates more effectively. Okay. And I think over here, we, um, in terms of time, let's make this the last question. Um, so this is from A. Fleming. Any genetic evidence for other archaic groups that modern humans interbred with, and in brackets, but the fossils not being found yet? There is actually. Um, so this is very tricky to figure out, but there have been papers that claim that there is evidence for what they call super archaic um, introgression or archaic introgression from unknown hominins in African populations. Um, and I think that's very likely. I think it's for sure the case that we don't know about all, all the archaic groups that existed. Mm -hmm. um, these genomic signals are difficult to um, extract. They've been, um, the studies that have come out have used machine learning approaches to try and identify deeply diverged regions of the genome that are inconsistent with sort of a normal tree. Um, it, similar things were done before we had the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes, and they are, they prove to be not always very accurate. It's really, you need to have the, in order to be totally sure about this, what you need in your hands is the, the, the actual genome of the archaic individual. So I would hope that in the future, our technologies improve enough that we can retrieve DNA from older specimens and also from specimens from less forgiving environments warmer, um, wetter climates mm -hmm. that would allow us to be sure about this. But yes, there are hints that there is other integration. Okay. Fascinating. And here's one again from Wida. Sorry, please, another question related to COVID. Is there a genetic factor? Then what? So there is certainly, as far as we could see from these genetic genome-wide association studies, there are genetic factors that contribute to susceptibility to COVID that mm -hmm. I talked about. Right. Um, there are also genetic factors that contribute to protection against COVID. I didn't talk about those. There's, there are also some that come from Neanderthals, interestingly. Okay. So, you know, our genomes are large places. Um, susceptibility, uh, this is just to be very clear, what I'm talking about is not susceptibility to infection, but susceptibility to severe outcomes, to severe mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is which appears to be immune related, right? So these are probably immune genes in this region. I didn't show what, you which genes are in this region, but there are a lot of genes in the region. It's not yet clear which is responsible, but mm -hmm. there are a number of um, receptor, uh, chemokine receptor genes in the region. Okay. Um, Janet, I think we should um, bring things to a close. So from my from my side, thanks so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, lots of fun. Thank you. <laughs>